Hi, Mage fans. This is your host, Terry Robinson, and my distinguished guest today is line developer, line developer, overarching developer, I will be corrected shortly, uh, Matthew Dawkins of the Onyx Paths. <laughs> we are here to talk about World of Darkness Ghost Hunters, and the first softball question is, so what is your actual title, Matthew, and how are you doing? God, I wish I knew. Uh, well, but that's the answer to both. No, so what is my title? I think technically my title is in-house developer because okay. we've got lots of developers at, uh, who freelance for Onyx Path. I freelance for Onyx Path, and it's still a freelance role. I'm not an employee, uh, but I'm considered in-house because I oversee all of the World of Darkness lines. That's extended to the They Came From lines now, which were under Eddie Webb, to Scarred Lands and Legend Lore as well. So slowly but surely, I'm expanding my empire. <laughs> How I'm doing, I'm all right, given the state of the world. In relative terms, I'm doing okay. In other words, everyone, keep wearing your masks. Don't be stupid. Be considerate to other people. And we'll all be all right. I can get behind that. So what is a ghost hunter as pertains to World of Darkness Ghost Hunter? Well, that's a good question, Terry, because <laughs> a ghost hunter can come in many different forms. This book is my favorite kind of book, and it's a utility book. It has lots and lots of options. And part of the uh, the bulk of this book, I would say, is the variety of ghost hunter organizations. And so we present groups like the Arcanum, who are, of course, mainstays of the world of darkness, who wish to sort of research and analyze every single aspect of the world of darkness. And some of them may know about vampires, werewolves, mages, and so on. And others just scratch at the surface and know there's something slightly more than just rank humanity, all the way through to reality TV crews on most haunted style a sort of docu-series where they go to so-called haunted houses with night vision goggles to make their eyes look all funny, and then a medium with them pretends to communicate with the dead. So you've got a sort of panoply of playable origins, including the Orpheus group. They are a kind of ghost hunter group. We've just got a big range. So the main idea being that some people like the idea of ghost hunters in the same form or as spiritualists and mediums from the 19th century, when all of that sort of entered the vogue of the time. Some people really love the idea of ghost hunters in the Ghostbusters style, you know, sort of almost industrial blue collar ghost hunters, through to corporate uh, attaches, all the way through to these more light hearted Scooby gangs. So, yeah, there's lots of different ways you can become a ghost hunter in the world of darkness, and they're not all sort of die cast serious. No more than any average mortal in our world will be. Some of them are going to be sceptical. Some of them will indeed be mediums, and there are powers to play mediums in this book. Lots of choices. One of the things I found fascinating, though, is you've made mention of mediums, and they exist. We have an entire supplement from the Year of the Ally for Wraith. But you also made mention, for instance, to the Orpheus group, which I know from the game Orpheus that is also in mm -hmm. Wraith 20. And yes. there are a few other groups, like the in-character fiction makes direct mention to the Giovanni, uh, the, the Duncern and the Milliners and so on. Uh, that, to me, at least within Mage, most of the non-Mage groups knew almost nothing about the world of darkness. Does this suggest that there are canny mortals running around with a fair amount of information about the things that go bump in the night or are these very much the exceptions they're the exceptions i mean it's interesting you mentioned that actually because it is almost the the strongest dividing line between world of darkness and chronicles of darkness and that is in world of darkness pretty much every supernatural splat as they're often known has its own form of masquerade, either by design or by, you know, they are obligated to do so because of what they are. People just won't believe them if they do see them. And so there's a lot of very ignorant mortals who tend to be cannon fodder, uh, bystanders, victims, and collateral damage. That's often how mortals act, whereas in Chronicles of Darkness, mortals tend to be a little more canny, and literally anyone could enter 
the world of the Chronicles of Darkness just by turning down the wrong street. The Ghost Hunters, I would say, are the exceptions. The ones who are legit are the ones who have actually encountered the supernatural and want to find out more about it. But again, keep in mind that some of the ghost hunters we're profiling are skeptics or are just people in it for a quick buck who may then discover that there's more to the world than they initially thought. In some ways, I see this book as, not necessarily by design, straddling the line between World of Darkness and Chronicles of Darkness, and part of the reason for that is because there's so few books for World of Darkness that present mortals as playable, as when you look at Hunters Hunted and Ghost Hunters, which kind of sit nicely next to each other, they are mortals who ha whose eyes have opened to some of the realities of the world, but it's unlikely they're going to start being able to rattle off the history of the Order of Hermes and all of the houses that make it up. One of the hallmarks of the Arcanum was, uh, collectively, they seemingly knew everything about the world of darkness, but no single person agreed with everyone, where someone would be yes. like, yes, I know a lot about ghosts, but your theory about the Kalawan and the UFOs is completely ridiculous. How could anyone possibly believe that? Yeah, and, and I would say that uh, in that respect, the Arcanum, Arcanum uh, are in that way very much like real world academics at a in the sciences for and philosophy and theology where they will all meet up and have great debates but they will all concede that they don't know everything they may not agree with each other they may disagree on many points but the hope should be that they don't come to blows over their disagreement in philosophy or whatever it is uh, whereas uh, you could argue they are somewhat refined uh, group of hunters or supernatural researchers compared to some of the others that are more territorial, more dogmatic, I guess, about what they believe. It's the idea, I guess, that you could have a ghost hunter that sees all ghosts as evil, they all need to be exorcised, expunged, this is the land of the living, not the land of the dead, through to the Arcanum who say, yes, we accept that some ghosts do need to be purged because they are dangerous and there is nothing more we can learn from them. But these ghosts are mostly benign. Let's study them. Let's find out what we can about the underworld if it exists. And if it does exist, why is this one trapped here? So you make mention to the Arcanum, which I appreciate gets a call out as being like, these people are decked to the nines. And I'm like, shit, yeah, my boy's got ducats. Um, <laughs> what are some other ghost investigation societies that maybe a general World of Darkness player may be familiar with, but that a mage player wouldn't necessarily have run into within our canon before? Well, I think Orpheus is probably the best example of that, because Orpheus makes no appearance in Mage the Ascension, and it has its own canon behind it. In the Orpheus role-playing game, they occupy a strange place in the world of darkness, because they are described as having ads for the Orpheus agency in subways and newspapers and websites. You know, you get in touch with us if you want to speak to your deceased loved ones. So, in a, in a sense, the Orpheus group are the very first, I guess, playable option in the World of Darkness that really presents itself as, hey, we're here, we're up front about what we do. Yes, there is a world that most of you can't see, but we can, so hire us. What I particularly like about the Orpheus group, and we, we, yeah, we uh, touch on them in this, there's case files related to the Orpheus group as well, is that they, and the rest of the Ghost Hunters, to varying degrees, can have good links to other supernatural creatures, whether intentionally or not. Obviously, the Orpheus group's strongest link will be to Wraith, or Wraith the Oblivion, but also... By the nature of the Giovanni, uh, they, of course, will cross the paths of necromancers. And so you can well see, hopefully, how they would likewise sometimes just stumble upon the same things as mages are interested in. Because I think, you know, the Chakravanti or Euthanatoi, Euthanatos, are the obvious go-to of mages who are interested in the undead, whether that's because we need to settle this person's fetter, <laughs> um, you know, so that they can move on to their natural end, or whether it's just because they're interested in harnessing the power of death, 
you can see how they may work hand in hand from time to time, or one may employ the services of the other to do something that they just can't do or aren't allowed to do, in the case of the Euthanatos, within the, let's say, strictures of their tradition. Okay, well, I can't touch this, and in fact, if I try and touch this, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble with a lot more dogmatic Chakravanti, and dogmatic Chakravanti are the kind of mages you <laughs> don't want to piss off, because <laughs> you te- you don't wake up the following morning when you piss off a dogmatic uh, euthanatos. You probably go to someone like the Orpheus group, who are mercenaries, and they advertise themselves pretty much as such, just with a glamorous ad, and say, there's a supposed haunting reported in this old asylum that's been vacated since the 1950s. Uh, Could you take a look and see whether there's anything legitimate about that? Just keep it quiet and report only to me. And then, when the Euthanatos is equipped with some decent information, they can go to the rest of their uh, group, their their friends among the traditions, and say, "Uh, an anonymous source has told me that there may be something we need to investigate at this asylum. So I think there's a lot of natural crossover. It's something that we don't, again, often get to see, because while mortals exist in every single World of Darkness game, their utility, depending on the game, differs greatly. And this opens up a lot of options to a playgroup because, as you mentioned, one of the recurring ideas in Mage is the notion that that which used to be done by a priestly caste, whether that be literal or figurative, everyone now has access to it. And what happens to a traditional euthanatoi or dream speaker, speaker for the dead, when I can literally go to a phone book, pay $40,000 plus $200 per hour to the Orpheus group to literally settle any issues I had with my parents? I think that's a Mm -hmm. a pretty great uh, mage question. And it also brings up one of the recurring themes in the world of darkness in the same way that the vast majority of 90s sitcoms wouldn't have worked if everyone had cell phones. Most of the world of darkness would solve all of its problem if everyone uh, talked to, to each other and was able to reasonably cooperate. <laughs> well, you can you can just imagine your syndicate technocrat rubbing his hands at the idea that uh, <laughs> the Euthanatoi are actually paying for someone to settle a, a restless spirit. You know, if, if that isn't my kind of magic in action, that the Euthanatoi is too scared to do it themselves or too unable, doesn't have the actual power the chutzpah to deal with it themselves so they literally have to generate some cash pay some sleeper who has a basic idea of the dead to do it for them just so no one gets their hands a bit bloody yeah get rid of a reality deviant and get 10 percent off the top that that's a win-win to me too yeah um yeah <laughs> and i could also <laughs> see that as an interesting thing that the syndicate itself would fight over do we want to legitimize this and make profit off of it or do we want to continue mm-hmm. to say that this is the things that go bump in the night uh it, i just think it's interesting that marijuana and ghosts could kind of be treated <laughs> the same way <laughs> like what direction do we want to go with that it works it is win-win as you say because if uh, this is very much a hypothetical thing. There's plenty of these ghost hunter groups that could be bankrolled by syndicate mages or indeed anyone who prefers consensus over the wild outlandish thought of these oxymoronic named traditions where we want everyone to believe the same thing. We want everyone to be ignorant. And the best way to do that is with cold, hard cash. So let's let's pay this group of sleepers to deal with the supernatural problem. If they get wiped out, that is tragic. But at least no one will actually believe why they were wiped out, because no one believes in ghosts. And the best thing that could happen is that some of these ghost hunters record all of it on camera, upload it to YouTube or some documentary series where most people watching it will be so entirely cynical and say, well, it's just a bunch of set-up, found footage, quiet, quiet, bang, jump scare stuff. Meanwhile, the technocrat is there clinking glasses with another one, saying, well, that's our job done, and we didn't have to do much more than make a PayPal transfer. Your notion of many of the viewers being cynical brings up an interesting question. Now that we are in 2020 and we have the idea of a news bubble, does it make sense to still have masquerades if the skeptics are still going to be skeptical and the believers are still going to believe? 
Well, I, that's that's another good question because uh, it kind of depends on the edition you're looking at. <laughs> because if you're looking at it for, through a V5 lens or just a 5th edition lens in general, we know that the Second Inquisition are about. And so even if the general population are cynical, there is a group, a powerful group, that will believe what they see. However, in 20th anniversary where Ghost Hunters more comfortably sit, I would say that we just have to look th at things through our world's lens rather than the V5 construct world of darkness. And I think you would see an awful lot of what you get with politics today, and to some extent religion too, where you do get the dogmatic believers, you do get the conspiracy theorists, you will get the people on Reddit, and they'll be saying, oh my god, I saw something identical to this it must be real and someone else will say pixar or it didn't happen and this will go on and on and on but they in their bubble will convince themselves that this is true now will that make some of them awaken that's an interesting question because it's a form of belief this could be a really to use the word again cynical way of waking up someone into becoming a mage if you present them with something that defies reality but likewise you're going to have just as many reddit bubbles facebook groups twitter threads of people mocking these ignorant asses who believe everything they see on tv and so that will reinforce a certain level of consensus a certain level of stagnation and i don't believe that the technocracy is always evil and i don't believe the traditions are always good you know that's a very black and white way of looking at things uh, but neither do i believe that the technocrats are right it's interesting that when first and second edition mage of the ascension came out and it was very much you're either with us or against us it felt like that with for me to me as a reader and a player that that seems to be the reality we've entered into now where it is very much uh you know we will give no quarter to your misguided beliefs you are wrong we are right we're not going to be shaken from that because if we're shaken from that we'll be betraying the people who have been supporting us until now and so when you look at it as a ghost hunters game and you're evidencing the supernatural through what you're doing even if you're not broadcasting it you're seeing it with your own eyes you could still make yourself disbelieve it because everyone around you is telling you that you'd be an idiot if you did believe it so it's, it's an interesting thought experiment so we have an interesting tribal angle, and I find it interesting that you talk about how the technocracy started with are you with us or against us, and now in technocracy reloaded agents dossier, there's an entire section on strange bedfellows, on how to cooperate with the traditions, mm -hmm. which is something we've never gotten before. Yeah. And, and it also suggests some pretty interesting chronicle ideas of a group of mages encounter a, a group of ghost hunters that seem to be having some success, or the technocrats do the same thing. Uh, do we bring them in-house? Do we crush them? These people are are popularizing this belief, but they're doing it to get likes on TikTok. Is that the kind of thing that we as the <laughs> Euthanatoi want to promote? <laughs> or when people are venerating their ancestors as Nakashik, is this the direction that we really want that to take? Do we want it to be next to an advertisement for a Kickstarter for a slightly improved water bottle? It is fascinating because mages, in theory, have the greatest capacity to do good in the world of darkness. Uh, if you're not including Hunter the Reckoning, uh, and even then, Hunter the Reckoning, most of what they do is killing. Mages have the power to create, have the power to mend, have the power to alter the substance of reality to improve life for everyone. But there's also the belief that the only way they can actually maintain that power their ability to do so is by keeping the majority of people in the dark. If you gave this power out unbridled, as we see in one of the Ascension end book scenarios, it could lead to the end of the world because it's you know unstoppable power un and it will remain unstoppable in infinite hands uh, with very weak minds. So you, you would have a, let's say, a group of mages, a gang of mages, a bushel of mages who who teams up with ghost hunters and may well see the use of the ghost hunters may well fully acknowledge 
okay, these ghost hunters actually know what they're doing. They may even know more than us on this subject, which is hard for a lot of mages to swallow. However, even if we rope them in and we give them a little bit of information, even give them a little bit of support in what they're doing, if they're trying to exorcise a spirit or interrogate a spirit or what have you, we can never tell them everything. We can't just open their minds to everything because we arrogantly believe or accurately believe they wouldn't be able to handle it and so it, it presents an interesting question for mages because what ghost hunters and other mortal groups like ghost hunters do is poke a hole in the hard traditional uh, belief that sleepers are sleepers for a reason that they could not understand this. But you've got these ghost hunters who can actually see and interact with ghosts. Not all of them. What does that mean? Does that mean all mortals are capable, all you know, normal humans are capable of this level of understanding? And if they're capable of this level of understanding, the world was created by three cosmic entities, or one cosmic entity that was split into three or whatever. So if, if you're that way inclined as a storyteller or as a group of players, it can really lead to some very interesting discussions uh, at a philosophical level and at, at a level of, I guess, power and power differentials. Not just, yes, a mage can alter the world, a ghost a hunter can barely tie his shoelaces. Not that kind of power differential, but a mage not only has access to that power, but, but can keep it from a ghost hunter because the mage believes the ghost hunter wouldn't be able to handle it. And, Is and that a fair thing to think? To a previous point, I believe the formal collective nouns in mage are a confusion of marauders, a descent of Nefandi, a monotony of technocrats, a squabble of traditionalists, a backlash <laughs> of apprentices, and a quiet of masters. I was thinking of a stubbornness of craft members but or, or a stubbornness of disparates, <laughs> but I have a fondness for collective nouns. You bring up the question of power differences. And one of the criticisms I frequently have in the Mage the Podcast Discord, uh, discord.me slash Mage the Podcast, is a lot of new storytellers will come up with plots that are just mages dealing with other mages and all their friends are mages and everyone's a special mage. I refer to those as Hogwarts Chronicles, where everyone's mm -hmm. just a wizard. But here, it really puts mortals front and center. And you make mention that there is a power difference. What tools do you give to ghost hunters to possibly... I don't want to say level the playing field, but maybe make them more effective than someone who is just used to mortals being cannon fodder would think. Well, I don't think you can ever really discount the the power of backgrounds as they exist as a trait. I mean, merits and flaws and the abilities that come with being a medium in ghost hunters. So the storyteller who wants to level the playing field, I think you're kind of punching at the wrong thing. Uh, if you want to make characters balanced, and balance is a very eh term for, to my mind, in World of Darkness, Chronicles of Darkness, and pretty much every other game that Onyx Path puts out, they're largely social games. And as, as soon as the social aspect comes into it and you can talk to the person you're about to fight or you can solve a mystery to get this clue, you throw all idea of balance out the window because players will no longer just keep playing to the same archetype. They will not keep relying on the same trusty tool. They may have a favourite spell. You know, They may have a favourite rote or whatever, but they are still ideally a nuanced character. I would never try balancing ghost hunters with mages at a raw power level. I would ask, what can a ghost hunter do socially in society? What are their contacts? You know, What can they reach out to that a mage never would or would never think to do? If you think of everything you lose when you become a supernatural creature in the world of darkness, and it's different for every single supernatural creature, but they all lose something. There's an innate tragedy to everyone in the world of darkness. A rank-and-file mortal who is only just starting to discover the existence of the supernatural can offer a hell of a lot of stability 
and normality and access to institutions and people that mages, vampires, werewolves and so on just lose as soon as they become undead or experience their first change. What are some tricks that you give to storytellers or to players playing ghost hunters that could wrongfoot the night folk that, that misunderstood what they think lowly mortals are capable of? You had made mention of mediums. Do we get any information on psychics or, or what used to be called noumena? Is true faith expanded? Are there any neat little supernatural systems that ghost hunters could theoretically have access to? Uh, yeah, there's Numina in this game. There's also lots of tools and devices in Ghost Hunters. So most of them are, of course, designed for work against incorporeal ghosts. But one of the things we're en route to unlocking uh, as a stretch goal is a book of antagonists that go beyond the incorporeal. And that's very interesting to me because if we get to do it, it also means we get to explore how ghost hunters would combat those kinds of creatures. So if that means we get to present things like mages and changelings through the ghost hunter view, it means we can explore a little more how ghost hunters would go about combating them. Uh, make no mistake, ghost hunters are primarily in place to combat ghosts. The The book doesn't go into how they would uh, take down a clutch of mages now. <laughs> but I don't see any reason, to go back to my point, why ghost hunters who belong to an organisation or are employed by a group like Orpheus or have, hell, have a television network's backing, why that wouldn't really intimidate a group of quite low power mages because you don't want to get caught on camera unleashing hell. You're going to draw a lot of very negative attention, both from mages from your own traditions, by a fan that you think, aha, that's what the, the mages in these parts look like. Okay, let's see whether we can wrench some power out of their struggling bodies. I think it's they have law enforcement on their side, and vampires and werewolves and the like do not have that, because they don't want law enforcement to get involved. They have the government on their side, and yeah, they have TV, they have the internet, they have all the mundane institutions that a lot of the time supernatural creatures will mock or deride or think, this has no power over us, but it has power over you when ghost hunters and mortals like them start using it against you. You make mention of those. You give a whole bunch of uh, mortal organizations that are used. You give a whole bunch of supernatural organizations. As you mentioned, there are a bunch of noumena in here, and they're completely new paths. They're not necessarily retreads of existing ones. We get uh, Whistle and Starlight and Black Hat, and mm -hmm. I thought those were yep. lovely and focused and evocative. And you made mention of equipment. Uh, to me, as a reader who, who tries to go outside the old bubble, I found it interesting that finally in Old World of Darkness, equipment is being almost used in the New World of Darkness sense, where it just kind of gives you dice. And if, yeah. you, if you prepare ahead of time, you can have some fantastic dice pools against people who are, who are not prepared, which I was, I was very glad to see. We definitely borrow some from Chronicles of Darkness for book, this book. Uh, I've seen some people in your Discord refer to this as almost Hunter the Vigiling, Hunter the Reckoning, uh, because ghost hunters have a rooted mythology, if you like, whereas Hunter the Reckoning is very much power down from above. Hunter the Vigil is power from the masses punching up, and Ghost Hunters has more of that flavour, I would say, than Hunter the Reckoning. And I think that's part of the reason why a lot of people love Hunter the Vigil and why Hunter the Reckoning doesn't have as much love behind it. People love the idea of the average mortal just discovering that they're, to evoke a bit of Hunter the Reckoning art, that their silver spoon has the possibility of tearing through the torso of a werewolf. I know some people hate that piece of artwork, but <laughs> I, I remember it distinctly. I'm really glad you like what you've seen in the Ghost Hunters manuscripts, because I think there's some really fantastic ideas in there for players and storytellers to have characters that can interact with the rest of the world of darkness and in their own way hold their own no one expects them to win in a fist fight with a werewolf but hopefully if a ghost hunter is sensible 
they will never get to the point where they enter that fist fight. And one of the things that is interesting here is um, I don't recall many other World of Darkness books that in their recommended reading list include other RPGs. I was pleased mm. to see Delta Green and Esoterrorist. This book also really seems to focus on nuts and bolts considerations, where you may have a werewolf chronicle that just involves going through the middle umbra and trying to destroy the embodiment of the corporate man, or a mage chronicle where you need to erase the idea of the number seven to prevent the undead from eating reality. This is mm -hmm. <laughs> very much a focus on, okay, it was Bob's job to remember to have enough batteries. Bob, did you bring in all the batteries? Bob, you didn't bring the batteries. Okay, we only have two IR sensors tonight. Where do we want to put them? Does it give you any tools to do that really granular? I'm not sure what other term to use. It very much feels much more slice of life, I'll yes. say, than a lot of the other no, that, games default to. That's a great way of putting it. And I think you've hit the nail on the head as to what we were going for. There's a big storytelling advice chapter. Uh, that exactly breaks down what you're talking about here, where you need to emphasize that these stories are told from the perspective of fragile mortals. That means what's scary for a ghost hunter, and keeping in mind these are horror games, is something that's going to be more scary for us as readers. You have to make a certain mental leap with all of the World of Darkness games, but for, to my mind, and this is my personal taste, you have to do it even more with Werewolf, Mage, and Changeling than you do Vampire and Wraith. And you have to do it even more with Vampire and Wraith than you do with something like Ghost Hunters. Because all of us are, hopefully, mortal. <laughs> and therefore we know what scares us. We know the fear of being locked in a dark room because someone didn't know we were in there. We know the fear of a um, big spider and you just walked face first into its web. Or you know the fear of you, you're walking home late one night and the batteries in your flashlight suddenly die out and you're in an unlit area because you live in the countryside and you know that there's another mile to go and you've heard there's been attacks on this road. There's it's a very mundane horror that of course ghosts enter into. This is why ghost stories even exist, because they help to fill the blanks of people, you know, wondering what could happen when I lose control or when I dig a little deeper than I probably should. We've expanded on that a great deal in the storytelling chapter, what kinds of plots you can run, and we provided a whole bunch of case files that cover a slew of ghost stories that some of them can actually be other supernatural creatures in the world of darkness. I think we mentioned Horatio Ballard in there at one point, who's a character from Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, the Giovanni, of course, show up. Orpheus shows up. So there's a lot, and there may even be some Pentex in there. But Ghost Hunters, on first instance, because they're looking for ghosts, they're not looking for vampires and werewolves and the rest, they're going to think this person must be a ghost because, his, according to his birth certificate, he was born in 1898. <laughs> There's no way this guy's still alive. So if Horatio Ballard is still around running Ballard Industries, he must be a ghost. And so then you play a ghost hunter's game where, yeah, you may be hunting ghosts for some of it, but then you run face first into a vampire because you don't know the true nature of the world of darkness. You just know a corner of it. And it's interesting because, uh, so Mage has Tales of Magic Dark Adventures, which was supposed to be the first in a series on how to run genre. And traditionally within the world of darkness, I would say traditional fear is not something that the games did well. They were great on Dread, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know the monster is going to strike, you just don't know when. And then fear is that the anticipation of that. This gives toolboxes for fear uh, being a theme, which I thought was interesting. One of the other key themes that this book mentions is the idea of mystery. And traditionally, mortals are listed as people who uh, scuttle through the dark parts of town because they want to avoid them. Uh, in, in choosing mystery, this seems to be one of the few books that really reinterprets what the word dark in World of Darkness means from bad to there is much that is unrevealed. 
and you create a world that is crawling with entities that is replete with references to uh, to mummy, to vampire, to all of the game lines. Uh, Orpheus, as you had mentioned, is front and center. And uh, to a certain extent, even though the X-20 lines were listed as love letters, this feels like a love letter kind of to the world of darkness to say, ah, we haven't forgotten the little things uh, you all loved. I don't know if that was on purpose or if those were just the most convenient things to grab onto, but I, I certainly appreciated that. It's something I try and do with all the books I develop. I like putting in references. I'm a big fan of connectivity. I'm a big fan of Easter eggs. I like the reader to feel smart. And part of the way of generating that feeling of euphoria that readers of role-playing games feel is when they're reading through something and they think, aha, I recognize that from when I read this book. And then they go to their bookshelf and they look through that and then they start doing lots of cross-reference. In World of Darkness, there are mysteries you can solve. There are things you can work out, and there are things that you, as a reader of a role-playing game, can solve. There are things your character can solve, and yeah, I think it's a surprisingly unexplored part of World of Darkness, so it was good to put that in, I think, because players like it, uh, so yeah. Uh, we we did it intentionally. I'll take all the credit for that. <laughs> well, myself and, myself and the rest of the writers. So you make mention that the primary thing the groups in here deal with are ghosts. Does the yes. book contain just like a big list of ghosts and ghost rules and so on? Or uh, is that something we're going to nope. need to bring to the table? It contains a tiny list of ghosts, but that's intentional. As I mentioned, m at least my perspective of World of Darkness games is they're primarily social. But expanding that, they are narrative, they are mystery-based, they're investigations. And what that means is most of your sessions aren't going to end up with you f having a fight with a ghost. That's just not how ghost stories work. And I don't think that makes ghost stories interesting either. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm saying that as a creator, you may feel free to differ. So we do have a handful of ghosts and a handful of ghost powers that you can use. But quite honestly, if you're up against the Amateurville horror, there isn't really any way to fight it. The Amateurville horror is like a phenomenon. Even poltergeist in poltergeist is a phenomenon it isn't someone you're just going to wrestle to the ground and break its neck so ghosts i think have a certain level of storyteller freedom and i think we'll be expanding on it somewhat in the stretch goals because i've no doubt well people love bestiaries so it makes sense to add some tools and tricks for them but i didn't want this to become wraith the oblivion from another angle because Wraith has everything you need in it to play nuanced, interesting ghosts with a whole hell of a lot of baggage. But the way I would present Wraiths in Ghost Hunters is as antagonists and supporting characters driven almost entirely by passions and fetters. I kind of boil supernatural creatures down to their core essences and say, this is what they are through the eyes of a mortal and yes of course this ghost is hostile towards you when you find it because you are getting in the way you're endangering its fetter or yes its main passion is it's angry that it never got to tell its daughter that it loved her before it died and now you stand to exorcise it so of course it's going to be aggressive to you but if you can meet it halfway if you can appeal to it towards its passions or if you can safeguard its fetters then that ghost is going to start interacting with you in a more cordial rational way until of course the time comes that you betray at which point the ghost will completely ruin your life and the lives of everyone around you i think ghosts are more effective as narrative devices than as uh, statted antagonists but that may just be me I do remember Satoris Filbricado is big on the idea that only give stats to something that you want the players to kill. And when he mm -hmm. refused to stat out Jesus in one of the recent mage books, I'm like, give him stats, you coward. <laughs> that didn't quite make it through. But to your notion of it being a social 
game, I am now going through Dickens' A Christmas Carol and replacing all of the narrative bits with just listing arcanoi that were used. And like, and then the ghost of Christmas future used Fatalism 3 to reveal his fate or something. <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah, it's much it less interesting that way. Yeah, but you can do it like that. And uh, when I look at ghost stories, I'm a big fan of M.R. James, uh, who wasn't a terribly nice person, as it does seem a lot of novelists of the late 19th, early 20th century weren't. He wrote a very good ghost story, uh, as well as being an academic. And it's very rare, in fact, I don't think it happens at all that in any of M.R. James's ghost stories do his protagonists ever directly interact with the ghost in any meaningful way. The ghost is almost an environmental hazard. The ghost is a punishment for something you have done, or the ghost is going to hound you until you fix something that you've done wrong. They have a very sort of reaperish uh, feel to them, because if you don't sort out your life, if you don't appease the ghost at some point, you will be found with a scream locked on your face come the following morning. Or they are very strange, inexplicable phenomena such as there's one where the protagonist, and his protagonist are almost always told in the first person, stays in a hotel or an inn in the middle of some Danish village and during the night he can hear a tremendous noise from the room next door, like screaming and banging and all kinds. And the narrator is trying to sleep through it, doesn't want to disturb the neighbour, but then suddenly there's a hammering on his door, and it's another tourist who says, well, you keep that noise down. And the person says, I wasn't making a noise. I heard it, and so the person walks back. And then the noise starts again, they're woken up again, and the guy says, you know, I can, I keep hearing you making this noise, and whenever I leave my room, the noise stops. And so the next time... The narrator gets out of bed when the noise starts, meets the other guest in the hallway, and they realise a room has appeared between their rooms. And it's only now that they are there at the same time that they can both see it and interact with it. And they have this terrifying moment where they wonder, should we open the door to room 13 or whatever it is? I think that's the creatively named story number 13. Yeah, I think you're right. I love that because it does something that so rarely happens in later ghost stories, or in any non-M.R. James ghost stories. As you enter the latter half of the 20th century and the early 21st century, the big reliance was no one will believe you. There was a lot of gaslighting in late 20th century, early 21st century horror, especially as, it, as far as it uh, relates to ghosts, that someone will see something and the most sympathetic response they will get will be from a therapist or a priest who will say, I believe you believe what you saw was real. But in M.R. James stories, a witness suddenly appears and it validates the ghost hunter, essentially. And I think... That's what Ghost Hunters does really well. It channels that 19th century idea of all I have to do is get someone else to see it and it will prove that to everyone else that I'm not, ma I'm not losing my mind. They actually manage it. And you never find out what happens next because all the M.R. James stories are very, very short. But I love the idea that this is a genesis point for Ghost Hunters. It's... I, I experienced this and I have not only experienced it and got you to experience it, but we have proof that even if it's just for us, we have seen proof of the supernatural. Now we can do something about it. Should we investigate it further? Should we combat it? Should we run the hell away from it? Which is kind of interesting because this now presents an opportunity where through most of the world of darkness, seemingly player encounters a problem. They look to their character sheet and they say, what cool ability do I have that will solve this problem? Uh, but here you're kind of playing as mortals and maybe the goal and desired power interactions that the developer wants aren't necessarily the same that you normally have in the rest of the world of darkness. And I, I hope that realignment 
lands with players. I, I wonder at all to the extent to which the storytelling system is going to get in the way and if something like Gumshoe uh, w- would have done it more justice, but now I am effectively promoting someone else's system and I will move on to the next question unless you have comments. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it, it's a good question because it isn't what the storyteller system is built for. The discipline or equivalent uh, trait that costs seven experience points or more to increase each time is the big divider between a supernatural creature and a non-supernatural creature. If you don't have that cost, then presumably players are going to be putting all their experience in their attributes and their skills. So they are theoretically going to be rolling larger dice pools than vampires and werewolves and the rest uh, for their mundane actions, which doesn't make any sense. But I think that's fine, because as long as you've got a storyteller who knows the power level that you're going for, or that knows the, knows the power level they want to go for, then they will dole out experience points generously or, or tightly as they see fit, and can always scale up the other creatures to match should you enter some massive maniac crossover game with changelings, mummies, demons, and the rest. And even in those scenarios against most of the night folk, except for werewolves and vampires, having a couple dots in what mages refer to as the sphere of gun is really hard to beat, especially if you're kind of prepared. So I always kind of hated those power level conversations when they came up as well. This requires another book to do. You can't Mm -hmm. just get this and, and start playing unless you want to play something very improvisational, which is fine. I certainly wouldn't take that away from anyone. But how do you deal with the fact that not all... X20 lines have the same abilities. Yeah, it's a pain, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was um, as as a bunch of mage wonks in the Mage the Podcast Discord. I think that question was asked seventeen thousand times about this book. Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's a perfectly valid question for which there isn't an elegant answer. Because yeah, uh, I mean, hell, Wraith the Oblivion at the last minute got I rid added, of Dodge. <laughs> Well, I, I and I added persuasion to the skill list because I I'm fucking tired of people trying to say oh, I want I'm going to use expression or I'm going to use etiquette or I'm going to use performance. No, just fucking persuade. That's what you're trying to do. So I have persuasion as a skill. Christ Almighty! But and yet I don't think any of the of the other World of Darkness games have persuasion. And of course, then there's some skills or some abilities that are classed as skills, and sometimes they're classed as knowledges. So yes, I am fully aware of the issue, and there isn't an elegant solution. Okay. Um, Ghost Hunters pairs with the primary game with which you are crossing it over, I think is what makes most sense. Uh, If you want to look at the most mundane character sheet, it would actually be Vampire. Uh, Vampire is the one where not one ability is specifically related to being a vampire, whereas every other World of Darkness 20th Anniversary Edition character sheet has an ability, that at least one, that ties to what they are. Uh, supernaturally speaking, I believe. Uh, Vampire is the easiest one to pair it with in that regard, but to be honest, it's not that difficult to just pair Ghost Hunters with any other character sheet and just replace a skill or knowledge that clearly doesn't make sense for a human and a you know, rank-and-file mortal to have. The key issue, of course, comes from the fact that the core World of Darkness lines were never built for crossover. So when you introduce a mortal splat, they have to sit as a an adjunct to another supernatural creature. If you wanted to really play a group where you've had vampires, werewolves, and mortals, then the easiest thing to do is just say to the person who's playing the mortal, which character sheet would you like to use? And go from there. I don't think it really breaks anything to do it. Yeah, it's none of them are too hard to figure out like, oh no, what does technology do? My character sheet doesn't have that. What about research? <laughs> I think we if you're playing an old World of Darkness game and you're and you're putting your hands akimbo going, this system doesn't perfectly match up. Where have you been for 30 years? I think that's oh, my uh, my yeah. formal response. When I feel grumpy, 
<laughs> as a developer of World of Darkness games, it's often at people, and I, you know, I love the fans. I interact with the fans a fair amount because I am a fan, and I think it's also valuable for the for the product and for the company to be able to speak to people about these games and gush about how much you love them because I and I love them. But sometimes I just wonder at why. <laughs> People are demanding conversion rules for Vampire the Dark Ages for 5th edition, as an example. The number of people now that have written to me, and I'm sure they're all lovely people and fantastic role players, and that for all intents and purposes they are probably perfectly reasonable people, have this blind spot when it comes to the idea of conversion or crossover or uh, historically dating a game. And so they'll ask... I really want to run V5 in the Dark Ages, but until a V5 Dark Ages book comes out, I don't know how. And I'm just kind of silently gesturing at the system and saying, what is it about this system that you feel won't work in the Dark Ages? Is it the fact that there aren't roads? You know, the old parts of Enlightenment, but from a Dark Ages perspective? Because convictions do that. Convictions completely channel what roads are. Yes, in a very very specific way but they work in that regard is it that all of the clans aren't out yet well you've got the exact same problem with masquerade if that's your issue so sometimes and it's like there's a blind spot sometimes people need to be helped over the threshold uh, to to sound like an ecstatic for a moment um which you some are. people need to yes i like to think so yeah, some people need to be guided, and that's absolutely fine. And sometimes it irritates me just because I have that same human attitude that everyone else does of, why can't you see exactly what I'm seeing? But inevitably, you tell someone how to do it, and they go, oh yeah, why didn't I think of that? I, I think it's it's kind of fascinating, the nature of the different games and the requirements they make of players. The feeling of not wanting to do it wrong or there being a right answer is yes. is a drive. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I see a lot of players talk about games and being like, I played Mage and it wasn't any fun because of Paradox. So we got rid of Paradox, to which I say, you're not playing Mage anymore. There seems to be a fat middle, which some people sit in uncomfortably where they're trying to figure out to what extent am I really capturing what the game wants me to do? What do I feel comfortable coming up with? And, and also mm. seemingly a lot of play groups, uh, when the book says it, it makes it fair. Like, I fully yes. understand that we want a system that empowers the storyteller to make interesting and flexible plots. But often when a storyteller changes something at the last minute, they the player may feel shortchanged, which is one of the reasons why I like the GM shift notion in, like, Numenera, where the player is rewarded because the GM changed a thing. And I think there is a certain mm -hmm. fear of not wanting to be unfair to players, which kind of leads me to my next question. So uh, we haven't gotten the X20 books have now come out, out over a sufficiently long period of time that this book can kind of be a commentary on what has come before it and everything else going on in the role-playing game industry. What are some things that you feel that this book is either a response to in the developing old world of darkness or the wider gaming community? Like how has the environment this book is coming out into affected it at all? That's a very interesting question. It's quite a deep question because this book has been through something of a painful birth. I wrote my content for this book as a writer before I came on as uh, the co-developer back in 2016. So a lot has changed since this book was initially was started being written anyway. And part of that's down to industry, because part of that involves the paradox purchase of the World of Darkness and other licenses. And it also changed some of the content we were going to include in this book, uh, such as the way we positioned Orpheus. It, uh, we also had to change that for Wraith the Oblivion, and that's because paradox are very interested in Orpheus and have certain directions for it. From a very basic standpoint, Ghost Hunters is an expansion to the 20th Anniversary Editions that not every 20th Anniversary Edition has. So to look at V20, V20 is the, I guess, the carbon origin 
of the 20th anniversary edition, of course. And unlike all the other 20th anniversary editions, and as they went on, they got progressively more expansive, V20 is largely a big omnibus collection of previously published material. It still doesn't advance anything, doesn't advance metaplot, doesn't expand the metaplot, nothing like that. Then with Werewolf, you suddenly get a book that's slightly, you know, slightly moving forward uh, with the time. And then with M20, wow, okay, so uh, Satyr decided he was going to completely turn Mage the Ascension on its head for the 20th anniversary edition and basically make a new edition what one could argue is the absolute edition. And I would say Changing the Dreaming and Wraith probably get the best treatment out of all of the 20th anniversary editions because they are the ones that got to skip revised edition and basically position their games in a modern setting for the very first time, in a 21st century setting for the very first time. And so Ghost Hunters goes even further than that, because we never had a Ghost Hunters book like this uh, in the previous editions of World of Darkness. So this is wholly new, and it isn't wholly dependent on any single one World of Darkness book. So that means the ideas are fresh, it means we have the perspectives of mortals for one of the very first times, because there aren't many mortal-focused books in the previous editions of WOD. So... It does an awful lot in reaction to the way the 20th anniversaries were built, but also how the World of Darkness was built in general. And yeah, its development process, things that have been changed, things that had to be rewritten, things that had to be written or deleted uh, as we went on and on and on through the development cycle of this book was largely as a reaction to various changes that have been taking place at a paradox level, sometimes at an industry level, sometimes at a societal level. If you can think back as far as 2016 and some of the things people were more tolerant of in an RPG, for instance, and I'm not even necessarily saying Ghost Hunters had something in like this, but I've seen books that have had this. There may have been material in a book in 2016 that you would not put in a book in 2020 because tastes have changed and tolerances have changed. And I think, um, for the most part, I can't think of many occasions indeed where the tolerance for certain subject matter has hardened to an unbearable degree or something like that. I think things have improved, but that means Ghost Hunters has had to improve with it all throughout its development cycle. Yeah, you really um, dodged a bullet from your original plan to have racial stat modifiers for uh, for mortals. So, <laughs> so good, good on you for, for, for yeah, dodging glad, that one. Whew. Yeah, glad we didn't put those ghost orcs in. Yeah, it is that kind of thing, though, um, whether it's from a World of Darkness perspective or industry perspective, you've constantly got to be aware, and it's the responsible thing to do. There's some fans who sort of stand up on their chair and will shriek that you're censoring material. That's that's what some people like to say. You're censoring material. You're not letting us see the game as it's supposed to be written. And what I always say to these people is, no, we're editing the material. We put our books through quality control, essentially. And sometimes, especially if you're looking at a book that's taken several years to come out, what that quality control constitutes is examining what was tolerable then as opposed to what's tolerable now. There's lots you have to be conscious of when you've got a book that's going through this kind of lengthy development cycle. And speaking of lengthy development cycles, if this goes well, should we expect more X20 books of any stripe? I hope so. We've always got pitches in for X20 books and as Onyx Path. And really all it comes down to is whether Paradox are happy for us to make them. I can absolutely understand if Paradox, the company, the individuals, were reticent because there is the, I guess, theory that you confuse the fan base if you or the customers if you're releasing books for two distinct uh, editions of a game. 
And I think you could have almost got away with it while you still called the 20th anniversary an anniversary edition. But V5 made the distinction that 20th anniversary was V4, essentially. So all of a sudden, you do have an edition gap. So you can no longer make V20 books. But if Mage 5th edition is a long way off, why not continue making Mage the Ascension 20th anniversary books if people want to buy them? And one could even argue the same thing for generic World of Darkness books like Ghost Hunters because it's almost edition neutral. That's how I like to see it. We don't have any plans for any more Changeling 20 or Wraith 20 books simply because those games were never going to be massive sellers, even though I do believe the anniversary books for those lines are the best ones, especially Wraith. I think I hold Wraith on a big pedestal. It takes a lot to draw a new fan, a new role player to an anniversary book. If they've never never heard of the game before, they actually need a brand fresh new edition. But the mage fan base is massive. The werewolf fan base is massive. And I don't know. Werewolf 5th edition is coming out, so we're not going to see any more W20. I strongly suspect, but Mage 20? Who knows? Uh, I certainly hope we get to do more books. As do I, and if I'm not mistaken, you wrote on Wraith 20, so I don't know if I'm going to call you impartial on that one. Well, I wrote on Changeling 20 as well. Well, Wraith 20 holds a special place in my heart for a lot of reasons, but Wraith the Oblivion has always been my favourite World of Darkness game. And it was also the very first core rule book I contributed to as a writer. I really do believe that that book contains so much and it's still condensed compared to something like Mage 20, which I love, but Mage 20 is an encyclopedia on top of an encyclopedia. I think Wraith 20 is more immediately playable than Mage 20, which to the unenlightened might seem a little like a tsunami as soon as you open it. (laughs) I, I don't disagree with you. So I, I, I fully understand that there's a hell of an on-ramp for Mage, um, and, and I get that. It's one of those things with the X-20 lines where I, I don't know if ever anyone anticipated that they would be as successful as they were and that the tide for RPGs would rise at the same time. So we got wrong-footed as a community to be like, oh, this game looks fascinating. What is the easy Tomb of Horrors way to be exposed to it? Is it this X-20 <laughs> edition? No. <laughs> So. No, but I mean, Satyr, I'm sure he's probably said on this show before, we've had discussions about it. If he could do Mage again from scratch, he would remove most of the trappings of the traditions and the technocracy. At least they wouldn't be up front and center. It would be all about the character journey. It would be before you even join the traditions, or you'd just have a few traditions, because anything else can just be overwhelming. So. Essentially, you start with a starter set. It works well for D&D, it works well for Pathfinder, it, it has worked well for Cyberpunk. Why not have that for Mage as well and ease someone into the setting? I think there's arguments either way because what we also know is sales always drop off after the first product. The argument is, well, we should front load everything into the first product so people are playing with everything possible, otherwise we could write it two years later and no one will read the damn thing. So it's always a gamble when you're making a new game like this. We we saw the same thing at Onyx Path with... So, like, they came from beneath the sea. All of the rules for Story Path are in They Came From Beneath the Sea because I was very conscious that I didn't want someone to have to know the Trinity rule set in order to understand They Came From. I felt that would be a barrier to great. Whereas Trinity, which, and this works for Trinity, and, and the sales have proven that it works, has a Trinity core, and then you have Aeon, and then you will have Aberrant. And so everything sort of floats around that central core book. So it's um, it's different for every every game line, but I think Mage would work best in a new edition, much as Satyr and envisions it with a very low level humanity focused, you know, fragile, weak mage, where even you know a, a simple card trick is magic beyond your belief because it's something you couldn't do before. 
I mean, Mage is a 694-page book. Of that, fewer than 100 actually outline the traditions, the conventions, the disparates, the Nefandi, the Marauders, and so on. I don't think that's the barrier. In a game like Mage, where you can play anything, I would argue the opposite. Having archetypes to glom onto takes infinity and weaves it down to something understandable. I think the magic system was halfway between what it was and what it could be. And that final mm-hmm. version that made paradigm, practice, instrument to create focus really ring. It just didn't get that time. So th- that is my personal opinion. There's a lot in the book that, that doesn't necessarily need to be in that book. But I don't think the traditions are the thing that are the barrier to entry. Whenever a new player joins the Mage Discord server, we ask them what their favorite tradition is. And that is generally the first thing they have an idea about. They look through the book oh, yeah. and they say, I like the fighter. I think the cleric looks cool. Or in this case, mm-hmm. the dream speaker looks awesome. That hermetic seems super cool. Yes, I want a ray gun. I didn't know I could do that in this game. <laughs> I, I, I don't think the factions are the barrier. And Mage is very light on meta plot, but very heavy on lore, which is to say Mage's history mirrors human history. So if you ask me what Mage lore is, I give you Gibbons, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, um, which is on the plus side, a great thing in its favor, but against it, because it does have that co-terminality. There is no convention of thorns. Uh, There is no anarch revolt in the mage thing. I can summarize the main plot points in mage on an index card, and it goes, fall of Mistrich, shit, modernity, and there's very little in between, but (laughs) that's that's neither here nor there. Um, No, no, no. I I, I agree with that too. Uh, And that's why I say it's, it's difficult to know for certain how to angle it. And I would say this is a kind of a curse that has almost filtered through to the Chronicles of Darkness, because I love the Chronicles of Darkness, and in fact I often find the Chronicles of Darkness more immediately playable than the World of Darkness games, uh, some of them. I also think that... So I, I think the second edition Chronicles of Darkness rule set is excellent. It does everything I need mm-hmm. from a horror game. And I would say that Vampire the Requiem second edition, fantastic, masterpiece, brilliant. Werewolf the Forsaken second edition, again, brilliant it made what i found quite a dull game into a game i love running and playing and then it's interesting because and i say this as someone who has developed one of these with mummy the curse that as we sort of went on with chronicles of darkness core books it's almost like the 20th anniversary design went into them and what I mean by that is by the time you get to Changeling and Promethean and Geist and Hunter and Mummy, you all of a sudden have every single playable option that has ever been printed in the first edition game line. You all of a sudden have every single power that was ever pre- presented in the first edition. Vampire and Werewolf, and I'm not sure on Mage the Awakening Second, but it's just not a game I've ever really been able to just get. But those ones were still quite minimalistic, were still almost, well, for for my money, still felt like second editions. But Promethean and later felt like 20th anniversary editions. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. In a way, I think it's a good thing because those games are always going to be less popular than Vampire, Werewolf and Mage uh, in either iteration of Darkness. And so you kind of, again, needed to present everything up front because you couldn't rely on people to buy your source books. But at the same time, is it a barrier to entry for new players who want to play Promethean, and there are some, who want to play Promethean the Created, and all of a sudden now you've got something like 20 playable options in your core rulebook. You have choice paralysis, because you've got no direction. Um, the theme of the game has been lost in the utility, and I love utility, but you can have too much utility. But it's an interesting game design question, as in the book design. What do you include? What do you cut? V5 has received a lot of criticism for not including every single clan from the revised era, you know, the big 13. But that's because we, as a team, when we designed it, thought we want to have a certain theme to this game. And we felt like 
having Clan Zimishi in the core rulebook, which is all about playing very human vampires and very street level vampires without any mention of the Sabbat would be doing a disservice to Clan Zimishi. You know, you would have no way of playing them in the game we presented. And so eventually they'll be presented in a book that better suits them. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. and you bring up an interesting uh, quandary. For instance, one of the reasons why I would agree with the question to not include all of the uh, playable options in Vampire or another game like that is the degree to which player options play into a dense world. The moment you give the player the panoply of powers, you're also requiring them to have access to the totality of the lore to understand the interaction between segments, as opposed to if you just have a big book of... uh, Mage the Awakening legacies. Those are not dense, as in what one legacy does does not interact heavily with another legacy. It's just, these are the powers that you can have. In your legacy, this is the cool little thing your group does, uh, and this is how you go about doing it. So that's one of those ones where adding an extra 10 or removing 10 doesn't really do much. But adding a clan that now has an interaction with every other clan, we're now increasing Mm -hmm. the amount of player understanding exponentially as opposed to linearly when you're maybe adding uh, different types of character playable options. Uh, I, I mean, in, in Mage, every no group has a superpower that another one doesn't really have, maybe with the exception of Marauder Immunity to Paradox. So adding another five traditions, you're really just adding five new paradigms and so on. So I, I feel as if that question is somewhat uh, game-specific, but I, I'm oh yeah, I, I'm curious to see how, how uh, ultimately that landing is stuck. Um, and, and as we close down, if you had the opportunity to write two more X-20 generic books. Do you have any feeling for what you would want those to be? Or if someone in the Storyteller Vault were to do one, which were the ones where you'd go, huh, I'm glad they did that? I'd love to see an X-20 for Sorcerer. I think that would be fun. You see, Mummy, I'm a big fan of Mummies, and in fact, Mummy the Curse was the very first game I ever had a paid writing assignment on. And so Mummy the Resurrection, however, I wasn't as keen on. World of Darkness Mummy, as it originally was, was something I found a lot more interesting. I found the World of Darkness Mummies uh, that were presented, they had a first edition and a second edition book before Mummy the Resurrection came about, where they were introduced in a very condensed, but to my mind, a very interesting way, uh, largely as vampire antagonists but I think you could play them with anything, would be the way I would go. Now, the last option is I would do Demon the Fallen as an X-20. Not necessarily Demon the Fallen 20th Anniversary, because I don't think that will happen, but that's just my belief, not speaking for any companies. Uh, Believe Mm -hmm. me, I have pitched it, but uh, I don't think it will happen. I could, however, see... There was a book at the very end of the Dark Ages line, before Dark Ages was cancelled in favour of all of the New World of Darkness, as it was, uh, called Devil's Dew, which presented infernalism in a Dark Ages capacity, and it was so well written, fantastically well written, and it was it was effectively a Dark Ages version of Demon the Fallen, but it was presented in such a brilliant way, and it's a book I recommend anyone check out. And yeah, I would love to do something like that for a World of Darkness book, you know, a World of Darkness Infernal, or Inferno, if you prefer, which was going to be the initial, the original way for Wraith the Oblivion, hmm. um, when it was going to be called Inferno. I know at least one of the projects you mentioned, uh, someone in the Storyteller Vault community is working on feverishly, and that project may already be in editing, and I look forward to sharing that to our audience once it is out into the world. If we are interested in grabbing this now, or maybe if we don't have the funds to hit it during the Kickstarter, where can we get a pre-order or reserve a copy of Ghost Hunters? Well, they can go on Kickstarter, of course. They can find the link on theonyxpath.com, or if not, the show notes. And if you check this out after the Kickstarter is concluded, it will conclude in on Halloween 2020, uh, then do not despair because we will add it to Backer Kit a few weeks later so you can get onto the pre-ordering then. The only thing you'll miss out if you get onto Backer Kit is you won't be able to preview the manuscript so easily, although generally you can just contact the person who runs the Backer Kit and they'll send it to you. 
you. Also, no matter how much people pledge on back a kit, the total funding sum will not go up so you won't unlock more stretch goals. So if you're invested in the idea of playing Ghost Hunters, running Ghost Hunters, or the idea of Ghost Hunters, I recommend backing the Kickstarter because it allows us to get more stretch goals uh, up and running. So please do that. Even if you're only back for a few dollars, you still get to read the entire manuscript by the end of the Kickstarter. And if we would like to know what you specifically are up to, where can we do that? Uh, so they can find me on matthewdawkins.com. I have a contact link on there as well as all my social media. I have a very lengthy credits page if you're interested in things that I have worked on. I think I've worked on all of the World of Darkness lines now uh, so in some capacity or other, uh, or all the ones that have been released in the last 10 years anyway. So yeah, uh, please do pop over, and I have a lovely Patreon going, uh, which is linked on there too. I run games for my Patreons every single week. I've currently got four on the go. Uh, I've got Campaign of Pathfinder, I've got a Chronicle of Vampire the Masquerade, I've got a new game of Broken Rooms, which is a wonderful game too few people have heard of, and I've got Call of Cthulhu, where currently... The uh, investigators are on board a Zeppelin flying from New Jersey to London, and uh, you can only imagine, as they're sharing the Zeppelin with a couple of cultists, they may not reach their destination. One of the things I've started to do whenever I see a post of what's happening in an actual play, I mentally add the line, and the girls will be here in 15 minutes to the end of it, and I found that invariably has improved it. So yeah, they're on a Zeppelin with Cthulhu cultists, and the girls will be here any moment. So I uh, yeah, send in the dancing amigos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're the giant wasps. <laughs> yeah, they're, um, they're the fungi from Shugoth, I think. But anyway, the giant wasps. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> My pleasure. You've been listening to Mates of the Podcast, which should only be taken topically unless otherwise directed by your doctor. If you'd like to support us and get a cool chat color in Discord, access to our secret channel, and other benefits of being an executive producer, click on Become a Supporter at MatesThePodcast.com. This episode is made possible by the support of those executive producers, and they are Anders, Andrew K, Andrew E, Brendan M, Bryce Perry, Christopher P., Chris Zach, Ira Grace, Jenna F., Justin, John Magnuson, Michael Parker, Richard Bat Brewster, and William. My executive producer shout-out this episode is to Chris Zach, who runs a bunch of swell podcasts under the banner of Twin Cities by Night at twincitybynight.podbean.com. The link's in the show notes. He needs to start his technocracy chronicle soon so we can have him come on to talk about what technocrats were like in the 80s with massive cell phones and such, or whatever technocrat chronicle he winds up running. You can subscribe to our show on Spotify, Anchor, TuneIn, iTunes, Google Play Podcasts, or the podcatcher of your choice. If you like us, please give us a review on the platform of your choosing or tell a friend about us. We have a hopping Discord community at discord.me slash matesthepodcast, and you can give us your thoughts and feedback over email at matesthepodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at matesthepodcast. Also to go to matesthepodcast.com for show notes and all of our previous shows. Remember, the little bits of plastic on the end of shoelaces are known as aglets, and their real purpose is sinister. Now go change reality.